Hello and welcome to What the Tech from Ghost AI, where we talk with some of the brilliant minds behind new and exciting tech initiatives to learn what it takes to tackle technological uncertainty and eventually change the world. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome to the show Climative CEO, Winston Morton. Climative is a clean tech company using AI-assisted digital energy assessments and blockchain to accelerate the decarbonization of the built environment. They create low-carbon plans for every building, which can be securely shared and updated by homeowners and those who support them to make better, faster decisions to reduce the carbon footprint of their built environment. Winston started as Climative CTO before taking on the CEO mantle almost two years back, but his experience and expertise in the tech space is extensive. He's an active member of the Futurepreneur and Volta communities, for instance, serving as a mentor for founders out of Halifax and beyond, while helping steer the tech trajectory of many innovative, but impressive track record. And I can't wait to pick Winston's brain on what it takes to build a successful clean tech business in 2024. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Winston. Hey, thanks, Paul. Absolutely. My pleasure. Now, I know I just flew through a little bit of a bio for you, but I'd love to hear from your words. Tell me, how did you get into the clean tech space and how did you get into the entrepreneurship space? Yeah, thanks, Paul. I've worked for uh, large companies like IBM and utilities, and I think I just keep getting uh, stuck back into the startup vortex. My wife wonders some days, but yeah, I, I can't avoid it. I really appreciate the innovation. I think the big draw to the startup and the scale up space is just impact. You can have a lot of impact as a small team, and it's hard to not enjoy that in my role to take these big problems and move quick. Take those big problems and move quick. I also love that you said startup vortex. That might be the title of the episode. Just to, <laughs> that's the perfect way of putting it. Um, I think a lot of founders do get sucked back in because to your point, a lot of impact from a small team. Now, on that note, I know I ran into some of your team back at Closure Conference. Big fan of Keelan. Awesome talking shop with Jenny since I met her as well. But tell me a little bit about the impact that you guys are trying to have at Climative and some of the unique innovation that you're driving over there. Yeah, it's definitely a purpose-based business. We're focused on really ramping up the low carbon retrofit market for buildings in particular. Our background is in the energy space. Climative started out as Simtech. We actually did a rebranding a couple of years ago in the utility space. So our team is very adept at energy analytics, energy estimation, and all the statistical analysis of energy. So we were in that space for a few years. I came on as a mentor and an investor very early with the team. And we really focused on trying to, I would call it digitize the, the utility space. And, and we did things like customer segmentation and dashboards for customers. The challenge we had was actually showing people what is wrong versus giving them an easy path to what to do about. So we kind of took a, a, a little different stance about three years ago. We said, you know, what? we have to have the easy button. We have to make it super obvious what to do in the market and we have to do it at, at scale. And so we developed a set of machine learning models and statistical analysis models that allow us to pre-assess entire markets for retrofits. So we work very closely with the federal government in Canada and we're just moving into the U.S. market as we speak. And Working with the governments and the utilities, a lot of our existing customers that we had already, we said, how do we really ramp up the, the digital side of this? It's a fairly old industry working on fairly old business processes. And whether it was good luck or good management, there are a lot more stakeholders now interested in these retrofit models, including financial services and municipalities and governments. So what, what impact for us means starting as many conversations as we can through as many mediums as we can for homeowners to get benefits uh, for retrofits, not only cost savings, but comfort. And there's obviously uh, carbon impact assessment savings as well. Absolutely. And I think also just to your point, having as many of those conversations as possible on as many channels as possible too, making sure that they understand truly what they get out of it what the benefit is to them personally, but also just the holistic view. I think that is really cool. And that is impact too. Now, I'd love to know, without giving the secret sauce, is there anyone, I guess, in the first place doing something like what you guys are doing at Climative? And if so, what sets you guys apart from others who are maybe in this market? Because from what you were telling me, again, action is the hardest part. And that's what sounds to me is the biggest differentiator. Even just going to collision, I saw a lot of companies that can tell you or guesstimate 
an analysis of what your impact is, but that resolution piece isn't there, at least as far as I've seen it. Yeah, the next steps. So if you take the broader ESG market or you take a look at just general carbon accounting that's happening in the market, we have these very large kind of holistic players and tools that are out there for enterprise, not necessarily for your personal use, but so we have kind of the top down modeling, which are very large ESG tools. And then we have things like homeowner dashboards that give homeowners at least some initial advice on what to do. So we kind of have both sides of the market. We're somewhere in the middle of that. We focus on the data. So we're more or less a data enablement company, well-built, scalable data platform. So we tend to want to work on large projects with large stakeholders like provincial governments or state governments or large utilities, banks, and otherwise. The market, there are other people in this market. There's a fairly healthy data aggregation market in the real estate space and the financial sector space. So we're not necessarily reinventing the the data model wheel. What we're trying to do is digitize an industry to take advantage of some of those data models. Digitize an industry to take advantage of those models. I I think that ties back to a little bit of what you were saying earlier about how when Climative rebranded, actually, because the mission changed and you wanted to get more in that digital sphere. Could you talk to me a little bit about what has changed since you guys started, which we've alluded to throughout the conversation, but also where you're going with Climative and maybe what's on the roadmap and what your longer term goals are? I think we could shoot for the moon in this conversation because ultimately it's, I mean, we got to save the planet, but yeah. what is on maybe the shorter term than that roadmap? Yeah, yeah. So the industry itself has evolving fairly quickly. If you look at our traditional industry efficiency organizations, today, residential buildings are, are assessed at a rate around 3% per year. And that typically is a physical assessment. That's our max. That's as everybody working every day as hard as they can. We can do 3% of the building stock a year. Roughly 50% of those evaluations have an outcome of a substantial retrofit. So we're down to 1.5% of the building stock per year. That puts us on about a 90 year trajectory or thereabouts. And we just can't wait that long. So, so what we're working on is how do we put information in the hands of building owners much, much earlier and much more, I would say much more holistically in the sense that you can see what would be the most natural things you can do in your home with the highest return on investment and maybe match the programs in your particular area. So we tend to want to work at scale nationally, but there's almost always a community level initiative for the building uh, homeowners themselves. So, you know, regional rebates, working with their cities, working with their local utilities. So the real change we made when we went from Simtech Climative was to kind of open up that conversation. We were very utility focused to start. And, you know, as much as we like working with utilities, you know, improvements of one or 2% in a utilities bottom line, they think they're hitting it out of the park and we have to make improvements of three or 400% to hit our, to hit our climate targets. So we started talking to a lot more stakeholders and, you know, again, whether it was good luck or good management now. Cities are very involved. Provinces are very involved. In Canada, we've got banks and insurance companies now have to report on finance carbon. So there's a lot more opportunities to have that conversation with the homeowner, right? So you can do that. If you look at the number of provinces in in cities across the country are doing built carbon disclosure at point of sale. If you buy or sell a home in the city of Ottawa, for example, or the province of PEI or the province of New Brunswick, you actually have to disclose in the future, you're going to have to disclose that carbon score. Well, around 6% of the building stock gets turned over a year. That's twice as many opportunities to have a conversation with the homeowner as we have today in traditional. So that's not bad. That's doubled, right? And if you have to have a conversation when you renew a mortgage, that's around 12% of the building stock. So we've doubled it again. So you can see now where other industry players are starting to get a lot more involved in the conversation with the homeowner. And that's what excites us. Oh, absolutely. It goes back to what you were saying earlier too, and you're meeting homeowners where they're at and the opportunities for that conversation, they're coming up in more and more places and that's changing the industry. And again, that's great for Climative. I'm even thinking, I was on the phone with Laura Gaber from Ecologica recently, 
And she actually got me onto a book, Healthy Buildings, that I'm going to be uh, reading on my next beach trip when I take my next vacation. And these numbers align so much with what she was telling me. I just think it's funny that this has come up in conversation so much recently. Just draw a fine line under the point that you made about the industry changing so quickly. I think this information is more readily available thanks to work like what's been done at Climative. And it's in conversation now organically. Like, right. I didn't, I didn't, this wasn't even me doing homework before the call. And I was like, yep, that 1.5%, that aligns because again, it's only half of that 3% that's actually going to be doing the efficiency side of it. So I'm happy to see that kind of the tide is lifting all the ships in that regard and that it really will hopefully help us all enjoy that impact that you guys are trying to make. Now, I want to go back to some of that local and also some of that mentorship conversation that we teed up on. Now, we got back to the startup vortex when we first started talking about how that's pulled you in a few times. I also mentioned, too, that you're a mentor with Futurepreneur. You're in with our good friends at Volta. They're some of my favorite folks. We're actually going to be publishing a pitch guide. I might be at one of their upcoming pitch competitions in the next couple of weeks, too. But Great. could you tell me a little bit about how the community has been there for you while you've built Climative and really at all phases of your journey through entrepreneurship, diving back into the startup vortex? Just what has that looked like and how have you leveraged community for success? Uh, well, so we've got a long history of, in, in particularly in Atlantic Canada, but expanding beyond that. So we work with, you know, Communitech and now we're working in Greentown Labs in, in Boston. So the, yeah. the the collaborative efforts, you know, it really does take a village and, and in Canada's, you know, got a relatively small population with more generalist kind of, of funding and, you know, to a large degree startup community as well. So, you know. We don't get into kind of the specialized roles in Canada that, that are available in the U.S., but the community definitely sticks together here. So, you know, we do a lot of work, you know, where we can with helping with economic development. I just finalized my last term with the, the, the board of the Halifax Partnership, which was very much economic development and enabled it. The rising tide that floats all boats, I think, is a really important concept. And in our world, Atlantic Canada by itself is a small place. So we don't really draw lines between, you know, working with the Venn Center in Moncton versus the Volta in Halifax. And to some degree, the Communitex would be even closer to some of the work we do. Lots and lots of times where we try to give back to the community. If there are smaller or younger startups that we can help avoid some pitfalls, we'll definitely do that. Speak with our peers. The other thing is just learn other people's stories and shout from the treetops, right? Is, is just help people out and say, Hey, I've, I was traveling somewhere last month and I saw an opportunity for one of our peers here in Atlantic Canada to engage. So yeah, it's, it's important. I think it's a really important part of our, and again, purpose driven startups tend to do that just by nature, right? Truly. I agree completely. And I think again, that even harkens back to. The folks who I've been in conversation with who were saying a lot of the similar stuff in a good way and confirming that the industry is listening and that that tide is lifting. It, it's happening because when you have that purpose driving you, again, it's going to actually be solving an acute problem. It's going to actually be touching more lives. It's not just startup for startup's sake. I personally have a soft spot for Halifax and Atlanta, Canada. I'm the lone Boston guy here on the Boast team. I love that you mentioned Greentown Labs. <laughs> I love when I hear people in my backyard actually mentioned. It's very rare when I'm on this because again, Boast is primarily a Canadian company. We yeah. do business across North America, but the yeah. community in Halifax, to your point, tells each other's stories so well and is just so super supportive. Yep. I'm our content guy. I really like that Volta is always down to do some content. We did a nice yep. funding guide with them. We're doing that pitch guide that I mentioned earlier, but the way they just support the community through pure play, just evangelism. I, I think that that's so critical. Like there are resources you can get. There are connections to VCs, all of that, that an accelerator or an incubator can really get you. But if you're purpose driven and you get people who agree with that purpose to really sing your praises with you, that's jackpot. That's the best yeah. you can do. Yeah. And money experience too, on the innovation side is we're Canadian, Canadians in general, we should pat ourselves in the back on the innovation side. Like we have access to very innovative frameworks and our startups and our scale ups here have second to none access to technical resources and funding resources, at least at the early risk, obviously programs like 
thread are, are important in that space, right? So we have, we're very fortunate in Canada to have the innovation engine that we have now. Sometimes you got to get on a plane and go find some customers and that's the the other side of the business on the scale up. But, you know, from an innovation point of view, I think we're super fortunate. I couldn't agree more. I feel like I've actually gotten in some heated discussions, not necessarily on this podcast, but with folks like at shows when I'm talking about just how impressed I am when comparing what's on offer in Canada to what's on offer in the U.S. True. We have our innovation hubs in the U.S. Again, I'm here in Boston. We think there's no world outside of 128. If you're not in yeah. Harvard, Greentown, MIT, the list yeah. goes on, then we have blinders on about it. But I was down in, I was down at MIT about a month ago, pitching <laughs> all of Canadians at MIT to come back and do their innovation work in Canada because, you know, it's got that quality of life and access to resources that you really need when you're starting up that new idea. You can be capital efficient and certainly when you're ready to kind of attack the market, you need to be in the U.S. to drive the revenues. But, you know, as far as innovating goes, I would say there's a huge amount of opportunity for U.S.-based companies to be doing innovation and partnerships in Canada. Oh, totally. And again, I know a lot of it's restricted to CCPCs, but to your point, just about like the different stages of funding that becomes available, like my tax, do, if you need some talent who are people who are in college, leverage that. IRAP, if you're putting together the actual work you want to do, make that pitch, get that funding to actually support it. If you didn't use IRAP and you're just using your angel investors to fund R&D, recoup a share, do your due diligence. Again, that's 60 cents on the dollar if you do the shred program. And you took the words out of my mouth. It's just very surprising too. Like we have a lot of institutions down here in the States. We have a lot of private businesses who will support you. But the fact that the Canadian government wants to be in business with innovative Canadian companies that they will help with the bill, that it doesn't even have to necessarily bear fruit immediately as a product or a solution. If you're doing the unique innovation and down the line, it'll be a differentiator. It's so cool. And it's not, it's just simply not on offer in the U.S. And it's not poo-pooing the U.S. because there's just simply so many more people down here and more money to be spent. It's something that Canadian founders should really take advantage of. And I'm glad to hear that there is consensus among the community too. And that you came down here to Boston to tell folks, hey, go back. (laughs) (laughs) All that said too, I know we kind of moved on to this point, but I'd love to hear what is on deck for maybe the shorter term over the next year for Climative and then part and parcel with that. Yeah, so there's still a lot of work to be done on on the digital front in Canada. So we have roughly 6 million buildings. There are odd different jurisdictions or at different stages of the journey. So there's a lot of work to do in Canada to kind of help create this inclusive energy awareness that we need in the market. It's no secret that past programs have been fundamentally high net worth family that are the first to take advantage of rebates. So we're seeing a, a whole new focus both in Canada and the U.S. on mid and low income solutions. So we believe putting ubiquitous solutions out there, they're a lot less intrusive. Our digital platform is easy to use, crosses a lot of the technical boundaries you'd have in a binder that the auditor leaves on your kitchen table is fairly complicated. And what we're trying to do is make it much easier to take action. So we do a lot of work in that space. We do a lot of work in program design where people are trying to build more specialized programs or personalized programs across the country. So we've got projects going on right from Vancouver to Newfoundland and in those kind of spaces. So there's a lot of work to do in Canada. I would say we're still an early adopter phase. So the large cities and the innovative provinces we're working with, but there's a, about a 90% of the market still is, is yet to come from the point of view of a late majority. So one, one thing we're working on right now is how do we take a solution that, you know, the city of Ottawa can afford because they have staff and they have political will to do some of this work. How do we get it to the other 440 municipalities in Ontario? So there's a scale down challenge and that comes down to community. How do you plug into the communities? We're not a large company. So how do we partner? So that's a, that's a big part of what we do. We're exploring that also in the U S you know, U S has got IRA funding with a big focus on, you know, mid to low income programs. So, you know, this is a pretty North American problem. Financial and insurance markets now and in the real estate sectors are now starting to pick this up and, you know, put their weight behind advice 
to customers. And so we're working with a number of those organizations to kind of get those conversations started much, much earlier this coming year. I, I love it. And you never hear anybody say scale down um, on this, but it makes perfect yes. sense in the context that you're talking about it going from an Ottawa to, I don't know off the top of my head, a smaller town in Ontario. Yep. You've got, you've clearly got a lot going on. There's a lot of opportunity and I think it's multifaceted, the opportunity. So it only seems like growth the way I'm looking at it here. And from just my notes that I've jotted down now, changing gears a little bit to kind of, before we sign off. What is some sage wisdom from your perch as a successful founder and mentor within the tech ecosystem? What is some sage wisdom that you give for someone looking to start a business or enter the startup vortex in 2024 as of August, basically? You hear a lot about interest rates, you hear a lot about the financial woes, but I think that's a lot of excuses. What is your take? I would say my view of the startup scale industry now compared to 20 years ago is the amount of really well thought out frameworks and tools available now. If you think about things like jobs to be done and product market fit frameworks, they didn't exist 20 years ago and they got learned through lots of good and bad endeavors. And so there are good formulas today to create a product and define the problem and, and validate the, the problem and the product in the market. So I would say, obviously use those tools at your, at your, whenever you can. And the other piece is like, you got to talk to customers, like don't spend too much time thinking about a problem before you get out and start speaking to customers. I think fundamentally climate of made that shift a few years ago where we didn't build any products that we didn't have a customer waiting for. And it really informs the product market fit um, journey. So that would be a couple of the the tidbits. The last one is purpose. We're, we're in a very interesting labor market right now. You know, you've got really wide swings on hiring and firing to some degree in the tech sector. So You've got really big movements in the market from the point of view of how people are transitioning between the large tech companies. And the, one of the only ways to address that is to have that battle cry or that purpose to say, look, this is what we stand for as a company. We may not be a small team, but we're, you know, we're we're an effective and we're a powerful team. So make sure that that purpose aligns with the employees. That's how we compete with the really, really big tech folks, because we have every bit as good skills in our team. We can't pay like a Google or an Amazon or a Facebook, but we definitely give the opportunity for impact. And a lot of people are driven by that. Give the opportunity for impact. I love that, Winston. Uh, And again, I'm here in Boston and I have a lot of friends who have worked at some big companies that weren't purpose driven. And sure, they collected a paycheck. They actually felt like it felt like retirement. Many of them have gone through the cycles of layoff. They've been through the labor market that you've talked about. And fortunately, a lot of them have landed at those purpose-based organizations. And I think that makes all the difference. I cannot thank you enough for hopping on the mic with me. Thanks, Paul.